Ever wondered how the Sopranos cast snagged their iconic roles or which Sopranos episode changed TV history? More importantly, how did the show turn HBO into a TV juggernaut? Today, we're spilling Sopranos secrets, from the Godfather nods to real mobster reactions. And don't miss the scoop on the failed Sopranos prequel. Grab your canolas because we're diving deep into the mob saga and it's about to get wild. David Chase's dreams were bigger than Tony Soprano's ambitions. He wanted in the cool Wise Guys Club with Scorsese and Coppola, but TV soap operas had him scripting doctors and detectives. Earned stripes, but craved more. What are you gonna do, go ahead and kill on me now? Fast forward, mid-90s, Chase drops a bomb. Mobster therapy, mom plots murder. Crazy, right? My idea is Saul meets Godfather too. Pitched it as a series, hoping for a pilot budget, a full season, Forget about it. Plan, bag TV cash, hustle for more. Boom, The Sopranos in the making. Oh, hey, hey. Meet Tony, midlife mob boss with drama. Soprano surname jacked from Chase's classmate. Mama Soprano, Chase's real life mom inspired troublemaker. Dr. Melfi, therapist, Chase's own shrink, keeping it in the therapy family. Look, it's impossible for me to talk to a psychiatrist. Interestingly, the Sopranos creators had to slap a gun onto their logo because HBO got nervous that folks might mistake the show for a musical. Oh. And believe it or not, the confusion wasn't far-fetched. Jamie Lynn Sigler, the actress behind Meadow Soprano, strutted into her audition thinking she was belting out tunes, not diving into mob drama. Chase's script wowed, but no takers. Why? Audience won't get it. Enter Chris Albrecht, HBO rebel, risk lover. Like Davy Scatino, but rational. HBO ditched the norm, bet on quality, not mass appeal. While others played safe, HBO gambled on a mature audience. And here we go, The Sopranos hit the screens, proving that sometimes breaking the mold is the secret sauce to TV goal. Picking actors like a seasoned capo, picking his crew, Chase brought in heavy hitters from gangster classics. Dominic Chianese, Michael Imperioli, Vincent Pastore, and Tony Lip were all in. And get this, Tony Sirico, the guy playing Polly Walnuts, oh! he was a real-life ex-Columbo family associate, doing time before stealing the show. <laughs> then he threw in Steve Van Zandt, not an actor, but a rock star guitarist from Springsteen's band, as Silvio Dante, who keeps repeating Michael Corleone's iconic line from The Godfather 3. That's when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. But the crown jewel was James Gandolfini. Interestingly, the man who would become the iconic face of The Sopranos landed his gig because of a Tarantino flick. Casting director Susan Fitzgerald caught wind of Gandolfini's talents after seeing a snippet of his brilliance in True Romance. And just like that, Tony Soprano walked into our lives because of a Tarantino-powered audition. Oh! Interestingly, before James Gandolfini snagged the iconic role of Tony Soprano, David Chase had his eyes set on Van Zandt. Chase was convinced that Van Zandt's humor and intensity were tailor-made for the role of Tony. So, Chase went all in, even getting the musician an audition. HBO, however, slammed the door, thinking an inexperienced actor couldn't handle The Sopranos. I'm losing my balls over here! Yet, Chase wasn't ready to bid farewell to Van Zandt. Oh no, he crafted the character of Silvio Dante with the musician in mind, bringing him into the Soprano world in a role that fit like a custom-made suit. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. Surprisingly, Michael Rispoli almost got the part of Tony Soprano. Rispoli spilled the beans on his close call with the role of Tony. Imagine the tension in the air as feedback ping-ponged between him and Gandolfini. Who was the favorite? The suspense was killing everyone involved, especially Rispoli's manager, who probably aged a few years during the process. <laughs> In the end, Gandolfini snagged the role. Rispoli became Jackie April in the first season. Twist of fate? Absolutely. Remember, Tony almost had a different face, but hey, we got Rispoli as Jackie. Did you know how Vincent Curatola got the part of Johnny Sack in The Sopranos? Speak. Before the show, Curatola only had two minor acting credits prior to The Sopranos. To act in Curatola came from a very unlikely profession, construction. Perhaps the notion doesn't strike you as surprising, considering the Soprano and New York family's intricate ties to construction within the show. When he was always talking about greasing the union, who knew that's what he meant? 
Nevertheless, it's worth noting that Curatola had just embarked on his acting journey shortly before clinching the role of Johnny Sack. Yet the auditions weren't smooth. Initially uninterested, the actor often arrived late. The competition was fierce, and doubt lingered if he could contend with seasoned actors. Luckily, his unconventional approach stood out. While others yelled Sack's lines, Curatola delivered them with cool composure. Sure you want to go down this road, Tony? What finally sealed the deal? His unique cigarette smoking style caught the producer's attention, securing him the role in this thing of ours. So now we just go back about our business at the Esplanade like it never happened? There's a pivotal moment in The Sopranos that nearly didn't make the cut. Albrecht, the bigwig, had doubts about Tony Soprano going all vigilante in the fifth episode of the first season. Tony sniffs out a snitch and takes matters into his own hands. Albrecht thought it might be a bit much like, really? Tony was already a mobster, but offing someone in cold blood? Albrecht worried fans might stop cheering for the guy. But Chase, the mastermind, wasn't having it. Through a mix of stubbornness and smarts, he got the episode on air with minimal tweaks. And just like that, the TV landscape changed forever. Tony Soprano went from a flawed hero to the full-on villain. Forget the Godfather. The Sopranos pulls you into the gritty, real-deal criminal world. Tony Soprano isn't your Godfather-style Don. He's a mediator, juggling family drama and turf wars. And let's be real, not everyone in his crew is sending him Father's Day cards. Oh, shut up! Why shut up! It's a messy, no-holds-barred reality check that the Godfather never gave you. That episode became a game-changer. It wasn't just a game-changer for us. Even the big shots, Chase and Gandolfini, called it their absolute favorite. And guess who else got a front row seat to the mob spectacle? None other than Matthew Weiner. Hey! Chase, impressed by Weiner's script that nobody else wanted to touch, decided to sprinkle some of that man's magic onto The Sopranos. Fast forward a bit and boom, Weiner's orchestrating Mad Men on AMC. But that's not all. Oh! Terrence Winter, a sitcom scribe, practically begged Chase to let him into the mob drama from season two onwards. Guess what? He became the writing powerhouse of The Sopranos, snagging not one, not two, but three Emmys. When The Sopranos' curtains closed, Winter birthed Boardwalk Empire and penned The Wolf of Wall Street for none other than the old man Marty. A lot of money in his shit. Oh yeah? The Sopranos didn't skyrocket initially, but HBO bet on a second season. Critics cheered, and an Emmy nod sealed the deal. For five years, Tony Soprano clashed with TV titans like The West Wing. The fan craze hit later. Before season two, HBO rewound season one, sparking an epic buzz. Season two's debut marked a new TV era, winning praise from Hollywood elites. Chase, the show's maestro, struck gold, but his demeanor mirrored a mob vault, closed off and shaped by trauma. Season five saw drama behind the scenes. Chase axed power couple writers, clashed with HBO, and demanded a graceful exit. Chase chalked it up to their inability to grasp the mob mentality. He grumbled about rewriting their stuff, claiming they had a reverse learning curve. He also duked it out with HBO, demanding a graceful exit after season five while they begged for more. Production hiccups aside, The Sopranos stayed grounded, evolving characters and sharpening dialogue. You gotta be on you at. Reality fused with nightmare and comedy, sprinkled with pop culture nods, like Tony buying orange juice. A nod to The Godfather's iconic scene. Since we're on the topic of The Godfather references, here are a few more examples. In the Fun House episode, Tony's grappling with the idea that his pal Sal might be a rat. Cue fever dreams in a boardwalk stroll, Silvio pops up, dropping a line straight out of The Godfather 3. Bonus! Silvio's rocking the same style as Pacino in the flick. Fast forward to season 5's kickoff, two Tonys. Tony and Carmela are officially on a break, and the season kicks off with a rundown of The Sopranos' home, leaves everywhere, a neglected grill, and a ghost town patio. The once pristine house now screams, family in shambles. And guess what? It's a nod to The Godfather 3 when Michael Corleone faces the fallout of his own failed family ties. Now, rewind to season one, episode three, Denial, Anger, Acceptance. Meadows belting out a solo at her high school choir concert. Tony and Carmela, proud parents, soak it in. 
Tony's even dabbing at his eyes, tough guy moved by his daughter's voice. Coincidence? No. In The Godfather 3, Michael Corleone, the master of Stone Cold Stairs, breaks down while his son sings. That's when I thought I was out. They pulled me back in. The Sopranos doesn't just break legs, it breaks barriers too. Picture this. The series is so anti-background music snobbery that it only plays tunes if there's an on-screen source, like a car stereo or bar speakers. No emotional puppetry here. Even the characters are vibing to the beats. Tense scenes? They're raw and unadorned, stripped of music to make them hit harder than a ton of bricks. But wait, there's more. Some scenes in the series are pure visual poetry, tossing narrative hints out the window. Ever caught the mind-bending 26-minute dream of Tony Soprano or the wild heroin euphoria trip of Chris Moltisanti in an amusement park? That's The Sopranos, flexing its visual storytelling muscles. Despite The Sopranos hitting screens 25 years ago, it's disheartening that the stigma around mental health still lingers. You don't agree that you had a panic attack? <sighs> Yet, amidst the mob drama and wise guys, the show boldly propelled the mental health conversation into the spotlight. This ain't just a mob show. It's a deep dive into the struggles of a father and husband juggling the chaos of his professional and personal worlds, all while his mental walls start to crumble. Witnessing this macho mafia archetype unravel before our eyes and then lay bare his flaws to his shrink, Jennifer Melfi was like watching a Shakespearean tragedy set in New Jersey. It's now, because we're not discussing this again. The show didn't just entertain. It made us confront the reality of mental illness. As Tony grappled with his demons, viewers weren't just tuning in for mob intrigue. They were joining a raw and honest conversation about the complexities of the human mind. I started seeing a psychiatrist. The Sopranos introduces us to a batch of characters who feel things, wrestle with their demons, and occasionally swap the tough guy act for a moment of vulnerability. And get this, the women aren't just there for arm candy and nodding along with whatever the mob boss says. These ladies are smart, independent thinkers, and they're not about to be anyone's sidekick. Take a bow, Carmela Soprano. She's not just Tony's better half, she's a force to be reckoned with. While upholding Christian and Italian family values, because, you know, it's a mob thing, she's on her own journey, dealing with the highs and lows of being the lady behind the mob boss. And the blood pressure medication thing? <laughs> Vito a fag. Big construction tycoon. Gana Scully and the gang pulled off a genius move in The Sopranos. They flipped the script on the so-called family vibe of the Italian-American mafia, revealing the hypocrisy in all its glory. When the crew found out Vito Spadafore was hiding in a closet, it was like sharks smelling blood. It was the medication I was on for my blood pressure. The betrayal was swift, and man, it was brutal. Vito's storyline was a game changer, shaking things up and leaving its mark on the entire show. But that's not all the show's brilliance. It went beyond mob drama. The Sopranos turned the mafia into a twisted mirror reflecting modern society. Take a look at how they tackled big issues like 9-11, the war in Afghanistan, Columbus Day, and presidential elections. White to the wise. Remember Pearl Harbor. In their own wild and unique way, the show gave us a front row seat to how these world-shaking events echoed through the mafia, and by extension, the whole world. The Sopranos pulled off the impossible. It portrayed the Mafia so authentically that even the FBI couldn't believe it. <laughs> Imagine this. Five years after the last episode, Terrence Winter, a Sopranos writer-producer, shared an amusing tale. FBI agents made Mondays about discussing the latest Sopranos episode at work, while, unbeknownst to them, mob guys were chatting about it on wiretaps. Different worlds, different takes, but both sides agreed on one thing. The show felt very real. Real wise guys used to think that we had somebody on the inside, Winter claimed. By the way, on my channel, there's a dedicated episode where we break down all the real and fictional aspects of The Sopranos. You'll find the link in the description or simply use the card in the top right corner. In the vast landscape of gangster tales, there's been a parade of wannabes that think they've got The Sopranos magic. TV networks got hungry for their own slice of The Sopranos pie. NBC's Kingpin lasted as long as a juice carton in the desert, six episodes. CBS's Smith? Liotta trying to be a gangster again, 
but it fizzled out faster than a firecracker on the 4th. <laughs> now let's talk about the shameless big screen ripoffs. First up, Travolta's Gotti. Picture this. A tough guy acts with all the depth of a kiddie pool. It's like someone yelled, Cut the therapy crap! Bring back the whackings! Not even close, Johnny. <laughs> then, The Mobsters. A sad attempt that pulled in Vincent Curatola to bait Sopranos fans. It's like trying to pass off a knockoff Rolex looks the part, but you know it's Fugazi. Something to fight. And don't get me started on Danny Provenzano's This Thing of Ours. Packed with familiar faces, it's like a mobster reunion gone wrong. Frank Vincent goes all in on the mobster vibe, forgetting that Tony's greatness was more than just mob lingo and slick suits. But let's still give the Shah some credit. 20 years in the can, not a freaking peep. Your brother Billy, whatever happened there? All right, Ted. Whatever man. happened there? The shooting. And of course, The Many Saints of Newark, the prequel we've all been drooling over, ends up being a bit of a letdown. How much more betrayal can I take? It's like ordering a gourmet pizza and getting a lukewarm slice with too much cheese, not enough sauce, and a crust that's lost its crispiness. I think, like me, you got goosebumps when you heard the woke up this morning theme at the end of the movie trailer. But unfortunately, it was just a foul on our feelings of nostalgia. The movie is nowhere near the OG series for a number of good reasons. First off, the timeline's playing hopscotch, and it's hard to keep track. You'll feel like you need a mobster map just to figure out who's doing what when. The plot? Lackluster at best. It's like expecting a grand opera and getting a karaoke night instead. Not quite hitting the high notes we were hoping for. And oh, the characters. We were ready for a deep dive into their souls, but it's more like a kiddie pool exploration. Missed opportunities left and right. Where do you get these fucking idiots, huh? Where do you get them? The film's take on mob justice feels like it stumbled into the wrong party, forgetting the carefully crafted code we loved from the OG series. They tried to serve up a feast for us Sopranos lovers, but what we got was a lukewarm dish that left us craving the real deal. Gabagool, over here. However, as the saying goes, every cloud has a silver lining. Not all the Sopranos wannabes are bad. For example, crafted by the Sopranos Quasimodo Steve Shirapa, Nikki Deuce brings mob mischief to a younger audience. Following suburban teen Nikki's amusing stint in Brooklyn, the film surprises with kid-friendly crime scenes, a good fella's touch minus the R rating. Shifting from family drama, the plot revolves around a four-legged friend with intentional nods to the OG series. The real showstopper is the star-studded cast, boasting Sopranos legends like James Gandolfini, Michael Imperioli, Tony Sirico, and Vincent Curatola. The same goes for an Aussie director, Andrew Dominic. In Killing Them Softly, post-9-11 America faces a recession-altered mafia landscape, mirroring Tarantino and Boyle's styles. Starring Brad Pitt as Hitman Jackie, the plot revolves around a poker heist gone awry, implicating mobster Marky Tratman, played by Ray Liotta. With echoes of The Sopranos, the film features James Gandolfini, Vincent Curatola, and the criminal mastermind Max Casella. Oh yeah? Yeah. No ass. No more booze. No nothing. Beyond a typical crime drama, the movie unveils a gritty reality of forgotten American cities, tackling unemployment, addiction, and violence. No clear protagonists intensify the raw atmosphere, making it an unapologetic portrayal of a society pushed to extremes. I don't take orders from shits like you! And that, my Sopranos comrades, is how David Chase left the TV landscape shook. He might not have snagged an auteur cinema crown, but oh boy, did he birth a cultural beast with his TV masterpiece. By 2007, The Sopranos wasn't just a show, it was a cultural mic drop. Chase's finale wasn't your run-of-the-mill farewell, it was a maestro settling scores with the mass audience after three decades of TV magic. That seemingly innocent diner scene in the finale? Scholars and fans all over the world have turned it into a national pastime. Frame by frame, dissecting every wink, nod and onion ring. It's the show that keeps on giving a gift to TV lovers that just keeps on giving like a mob drama that never truly sleeps. So here's to The Sopranos, the show that changed the game and left us craving for more, even after all these years. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to Vano VHS and hit the like button.
And if you want to show some love to Vano VHS, you can now buy us a coffee. Check out the link on your screens.